Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Roy Jockham Stoller, the Chief of Police for the City of O'Fallon. Standing to my right is uh, Mr. Tim Lomar, who is the uh, prosecuting attorney for St. Charles County. Uh, Captain Jeff Gray is uh, also to the right, along with Lieutenant Mike Grawich and Detective Sergeant Brian Wilkie. I'll let uh, Mr. Lomar introduce his staff. Good afternoon. Uh, to my uh, left is my lead trial attorney, Phil Grenway. Uh, to his right is our uh, lead investigator in this case, Mike Harvey. And to my far right is my chief docket attorney, Steve Colbert. Thank you, Tim. Following an extensive investigation at approximately 11 a.m. this morning, Pamela Hupp, a 57-year-old O'Fallon resident, was arrested after leaving her residence in the 1200 block of Little Brave Drive with the ch for the charges of murder first degree and armed criminal action. This arrest followed an incident on August 16th of this year, where in about 1210 that date, Louis Gumpenberger was shot and killed by Pamela Hupp while he was at her residence. The investigation began on that date and culminated with the case being presented to the St. Charles County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. I'll now call on Mr. Lomar. Thank you, Chief. Uh, this time I'd like to briefly outline the facts that were revealed by the investigation. Before I do that, I would like to take an opportunity to uh, recognize the chief as well as his staff um, here at the O'Fallon Police Department for uh, an outstanding investigation. Uh, they thoroughly, efficiently, and swiftly investigated each and every lead, and uh, I am very confident that uh, we have uh, a, great, uh, a great set of evidence here to move forward with these charges. So please allow me to briefly explain what the evidence that was revealed by this investigation is. On August 16th, 2016, a female caller called 911 at approximately 12.08 p.m. to report that someone was actively breaking into her house. While on the phone with dispatch, the caller told the dispatcher that she had a male intruder in her house and that she had shot him. Medical personnel later pronounced the subject deceased inside the residence. The first responding officer spoke to the caller. It was at this point that the caller was identified as Pamela Hupp. Hupp repeatedly told the officer that she did not know the subject whom she had just shot. Hupp also repeatedly told the officer that the subject told Hupp multiple times that he wanted to go to the bank to get Russ's money. Hupp also repeated that she did not know anyone named Russ and she did not have any idea what the subject was talking about. Hupp told officers and medics that she was not injured during the incident. Hupp was checked and cleared on the scene by medics. The investigation quickly began to re reveal the following. Hupp indicated that a silver four-door sedan quickly pulled up onto her street and stopped directly behind her driveway. At that time, a male subject got out of the passenger side of the vehicle ran up to her vehicle and entered the cabin through the passenger front door. The silver four-door vehicle quickly then left the area. Meanwhile, the male subject put a knife to Hupp's throat and kept telling her that she was going to take him to the bank and also, excuse me, that she was going to take him to the bank to, quote, get Russ's money. She said the subject kept looking back over his shoulder while yelling at her, and at some point, as he was looking over his shoulder, Hupp struck his arm with her arm, knocking the knife out of his hand. Hupp then exited her vehicle and ran inside of her residence through the garage door. The subject pursued her into the garage while yelling, among other things, that he was going to kill her. While trying to keep him from entering her home, she began to call 911 numerous times. The first two calls failed to go through. 
but the third call connected. It was at this point that she realized she was going to be unable to keep the subject out of the house, and she ran into the master bedroom to get a revolver from behind the nightstand, and she shot the subject while he was advancing through her bedroom door. The subject was not armed with a weapon when he was shot by Huff. She indicated that she shot him multiple times until the gun stopped firing. A search warrant was later obtained for Huff's residence and her vehicle. Members of the St. Charles County Police Crime Scene Investigation Unit, along with detectives from the O'Fallon Police Department, examined and processed the scene upon execution of the search warrant in conjunction with her written consent to search. The deceased male subject was positively identified by his fingerprints as Louis R. Gumpenberger. Gumpenberger did not have a wallet or a cell phone or any other identifying information on his person at the time he was found by the first responders. However, investigation revealed that a handwritten note in $900 in United States currency that was double bagged in a Ziploc bag was located in each of Gumpenberger's pockets. Further research on Gumpenberger revealed that he suffered a traumatic brain injury after a vehicle accident in 2005. And as a result of his traumatic brain injury, Gumpenberger had slurred speech and other physical and mental limitations. Gumpenberger did not drive and did not have a known income. The handwritten note located in Gumpenberger's pocket appeared to be instructions for Gumpenberger to kidnap Huff, get Russ's money from Huff at her bank, and then kill Huff in order to collect the rest of the $10,000. The note also mentioned the last name Faria. After originally telling first responding officers that she did not know a Russ, Huff then acknowledged in the subsequent discussion that she did in fact know Russ Faria. Huff surmised that the note was referencing a life insurance payout related to the Russ Faria murder trials that were held in Lincoln County. Extensive canvassing and interviews failed to produce any known links whatsoever between Gumpenberger and Hupp or Faria. As the investigation ensued, a female subject was later identified and interviewed. This female subject on August the 10th, 2016, six days prior to the death of Gumpenberger. She called 911 to report a suspicious circumstance to another St. Charles County law enforcement agency. This subject reported that in that incident, a white female in a dark colored SUV randomly pulled up to her while she was standing outside of her residence. The woman inside the SUV told her that she was a producer from the Dateline television show. And she tried to recruit this individual to go with her to do a sound bite for an upcoming Dateline episode regarding 911 calls. She was told that she would be given a script and she was promised $1,000 in cash, both up front and after the completion of the sound bite. The female subject initially agreed to go with the female who was driving the SUV but then shortly thereafter demanded to be taken back to her home. When the female driver did not report any, uh, produce any credentials, excuse me, indicating that she was in fact a Dateline reporter. The female subject then captured this incident that I've just described on surveillance cameras that she had affixed to her home. A review of that video showed that the vehicle in question was a dark colored GMAC Acadia with a Missouri license plate that matches license plates issued to Pamela Hupp. The female subject later picked out Hupp out of a photo array lineup and positively identified her as the person posing as the Dateline reporter who lured her into the vehicle. 
Extensive interviews of people who knew Gumpenberger, the victim of this case, said that his mother drove him to his doctor's appointments and he walked everywhere else. Investigation further revealed that uh, she described driving by, excuse me, Hupp uh, described driving by her daughter's residence on the morning of August 16th, 2016, the day of Gumpenberger's death. Hub's daughter lived approximately two miles from Gumpenberger's apartment. The investigation revealed that Hub had her cell phone with her as she was driving around during the morning hours of August 16th, 2016. A search warrant was served on Google, who provided historical location data related to her specific device. One latitude and longitude location provided by Google resolved to Gumpenberger's apartment complex. This occurred between 11.25 a.m. and 11.29 a.m. on August 16, 2016. The 911 call was, were first placed at 12.04 p.m. on that same day. As of this morning, as indicated by the chief, Hupp is presently in custody. The court has set her bond at $2 million cash only, no 10%, no surety. Uh, at this time, we will uh, entertain uh, questions for a brief amount of time. Chief? I was going to. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, let me interrupt just for a moment. While in custody this morning, just before noon today, Pamela Hupp indicated that she uh, needed to use the restroom. While inside the female bathroom, Pamela Hupp began stabbing herself on her wrist and in her neck, or on her neck, with a ballpoint pen she had secreted on her person before entering. An assigned female police officer interrupted those actions and immediately rendered aid after summoning medical personnel. Pamela Hupp was conveyed to an area hospital where she is being treated at, at this time and she is in stable condition. Now I think uh, we're gonna, uh, we'll entertain a, a few questions. Before we start, obviously we, we're limited in what we can say, uh, but uh, having said that, uh, fire away. Uh, The evidence uh, seems to indicate that uh, she hatched a plot to find an innocent victim and to murder this innocent victim in an apparent effort to frame somebody else. Well, the first thing that I would say is uh, I, I don't have the details of the Lincoln County case. That's a separate jurisdiction, uh, separate investigation. Um, and as much as I'd like some of those answers as well, I don't have them uh, at this point in time. Um, I think there's enough out there uh, in, in the public consciousness that uh, would lead you to, to believe or arrive at certain conclusions. But as of now, we do not have uh, any specific reasons why she would do this. How far back did you potentially go with cell phone data? Um, we're, I know we've, uh, we've already uh, sent subpoenas out, investigative subpoenas are out to uh, all the, uh, the relevant um, cell phone providers. Um, we are in the process of figuring out just how far back we're able to go, so I can't answer your question specifically at this point. Can you talk about, you said a minute ago you she was outside Governor Murray's apartment. How did you then think Governor Murray got to her house? Can you elaborate on that timeline? Well, I will say this, uh, the, the evidence that we have, if you piece it all together, and obviously you don't have the benefit of having seen that, uh, there's a very specific timeline. Things had to have happened in a certain sequence within a very small frame of time. Uh, the coordinates that we received and were able to decipher from Google indicate a timeline that is corroborated by other external evidence that puts her at or near the location of this very apartment. We know she was there for about four minutes. 
um, what happened at that scene. Uh, I can't speak to that yet because we don't have direct information at this time. And how do you guys have any idea why a murder, what led her to this person? There doesn't seem to be any link between Hupp and Gumpenberger. Um, we believe that this was a random, random act. I got to be careful to get too far into the evidence. Uh, let's say that's a, that's a very good theory, and we're following that theory. We're already uh, in process of, uh, of ascertaining that. What was the purpose of the ruse of her posing as a producer to pay for him to pick up that murder? I don't think we can identify a purpose uh, necessarily. Uh, I think our, our theory, and it's, a, it's a, a theory shared by all of us up here, everybody who's had a chance to look at all the evidence, uh, is that uh, she was vetting uh, a potential victim. And uh, the, uh, the person that came forward to describe her scenario that was captured on the surveillance camera, uh, the information she provided us matches up uh, very similarly with other information that we found uh, as it relates to the 911 call and the interaction between she and Gumpenberger at her residence. Do you have any indication at this point if she has been, this is the third odd death that she has been close to? We don't have any indication uh, about anything other than what we've just talked about today. Um, I understand uh, those questions are, are, are fair questions. Um, we are limited just to what our team has put together. Um, we're very confident that, uh, that we've got uh, very solid evidence to support the conviction here. Um, having said that, I, I can't speak to the evidence in the other cases. Because the Veterans Korea case remains unsolved, and there is a jurisdictional issue there, should hypothetically the feds be involved, or are they involved? Uh, I can't comment on, on any investigation that the, uh, the federal government might be involved in, but generally speaking, I can say there would, they would have jurisdiction uh, to explore an investigation in that, in that situation. And was the, the note in the pocket in the $900 in the Ziploc bag just a counterfeit? We believe that Gumpenberger did not put those in his pockets. Um, I'm not going to be able to comment uh, on anything like that, unfortunately. Any indication that there was anyone else involved in this elaborate plan? None. Uh, the night that uh, that uh, the suspect claimed was uh, wielded by Gumpenberger at the scene, was that recovered? It was. Uh, it was found in the uh, in Ms. Huff's vehicle. <laughs> uh, I, I will say that uh, we're confident we know where that came from. You know, that part of the investigation is still ongoing. We're speaking to people in that neighborhood the day it happened. Uh, no one really saw much. I mean, so you believe that this was all carried out without anyone witnessing it, Gumpenberger Department or her home in O'Fallon? I mean, were there other witnesses that gave you guys the clues to, that something was odd here? Right now, we're confident that we have uh, conducted this investigation and did all those interviews. But we would also ask that if anybody out there that has been approached by Pamela Hupp to, to give us a call. We know that, uh, as Mr. Lomar had indicated, we know that she did approach one other person. So if there's anyone else that uh, has been approached, we'd certainly, certainly want to talk with them. arrived on scene, did you guys realize this looked like something other than a burglary or home invasion? Well, it, it, uh, I, I couldn't give you an estimate, but when, uh, when the detectives really started looking into it, there was a lot of questions that they wanted answered that uh, just wasn't clear from the scene. And from that, it developed into other information, and they just followed every lead, which was quite a few leads, by the way, I might add. Did you 
Well, right now she's still in our custody while, while she's being treated. Uh, she would be transferred to the St. Charles County uh, authorities, jail authorities. Uh, it was a revolver, but I'm I'm not playing stupid here. <laughs> it's just the way I look. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know if it was a five shot or six shot. It was a revolver, though. And, and could she explain why she why she had it so close at hand? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of that she would give anything except that she uh, she has guns in the house. Oh, you mean this morning? Yeah. Uh, we thought it was best that uh, we could control the situation a lot better on the street than trying to try to enter her house. Well, from as uh, Mr. Lomar indicated, it, it appears that she was searching for a uh, a patsy that could possibly take some heat off her. Now, that's just Roy Jockemstaller speaking. The evidence will will show that uh, she wanted to do a reenactment, supposedly involving 911, the 911 calls, and during that reenactment, apparently. She shot and killed Mr. Gumpenberger. We also, the investigation revealed that she had approached someone else to do this reenactment or whatever. So our conclusions are she was looking for a victim. How did you make that connection between that other person? Is that something you went back to the archives and they remembered it? Because you said it was uh, uh, sometime earlier. We received it. It was a. It was a, a six days or a few days earlier, we received information that she had been approached and we interviewed her. So. Oh, even before the shooting? Oh, no, no, okay. we did not. That, that, wasn't, uh, that, w that wasn't brought to our attention until <laughs> after the shooting. Okay. So you think that she was looking for someone else to place blame in terms of Gumpenberg and Mark? I, I think she, uh, just from the, the conclusion I would draw would be that she was trying to look for someone that could take some heat off her because of that previous case. Did you, I mean, have you ever heard of a, I mean, it's such a convoluted tale. Yes. Have you, have you ever? <laughs> yes, I mean, it is. And, and, and that's why it's very important that the detectives and this team didn't close their mind into any one, one uh, direction to go. They had to keep an open mind in this. No, she, the the uh, the case that we investigated here in the city of O'Fallon is is cleared by arrest now with her. We uh, we know we got the right person. You mentioned the victim's mental and physical limitations. Then, do you think that she saw that as an easy as an easy target? Or she, I mean, do you really think she knew what she would be put up to? I think uh, she was very calculated and looking for somebody to fit a particular profile. I think this uh, victim unfortunately fit that profile. Uh, somebody who uh, may not be sophisticated, somebody who might be easily persuaded by uh, a decent amount of cash. Um, I don't think she anticipated that uh, it would turn out that he had the physical and mental disabilities that he did have. Uh, and I think that uh, that's part of her undoing here. We'll, uh, we'll answer a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Where is the evidence? Sure. Um, the, uh, the victim <coughs> in this case, Mr. Gumpenberger, he lived in St. Charles City, lived in a particular apartment complex. The investigation revealed that her vehicle uh, traversed the road in front of his apartment complex twice, and the coordinates also showed that she stopped in front of his very apartment complex inside 
the complex for a period of at least four minutes. We have uh, witnesses who put him outside of his apartment complex within that approximate time frame. What happened from the time she pulled up till the time he got into the car, we don't know. And was it the same ruse to him about the Dateline to Dateline and 911 call story kind of thing? I will say that the, uh, the story about the Dateline report and the 911 script that was provided to us by this third party witness, it was very, very similar to what we were able to hear on the 911 call. Uh, we're going to end this now. I just want uh, one comment. Many of you in the room know my background and my, uh, my experience. And during my career, I've had the uh, honor and privilege of working with a number of uh, great detectives. Let me say this. I would put our detective bureau in the O'Fallon Police Department up against any detectives that I have ever worked with in my whole career. These guys did one, one heck of a job and uh, they followed every lead and uh, I just can't, can't help but tell you that I'm very, very proud of them. Thank you.